Well, welcome to our fifth lecture in our series, uh, Introduction to Eastern Orthodoxy. And today we're going to be talking about Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. What are the differences? I think it's fair to say that the differences between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy are more numerous from our perspective than from a Roman Catholic perspective. And um, I just want to say something about how this talk is going to go. I have a little outline there. A lot of times this, this kind of talk will start with, you know, here's some big doctrinal differences like papal supremacy and papal infallibility. But I actually want to start somewhere different. I want to talk about the approach to theology itself that's taken from the Roman Catholic Church and then move on to similarities and differences in spiritually, spirituality and practice, then uh, how sacraments differ between the, two, between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, and then finally we'll go to the specific doctrinal differences that often, you know, are what a lot of talks like this are about. And before I want to, before I go on, I want to just give a little preamble um, to say that we Orthodox lost a lot in the schism, and we're certainly not in this lofty position to be able to judge individual Catholics. There's many, many devout Catholics who are far more you know, who put most of us to shame in terms of their prayer life, in terms of their commitment to Christ, in terms of their knowledge and commitment to Holy Scripture, um, their dedication to God, and so on. And also as a body, you know, Catholics have been far more active than Orthodoxy in holding up the banner of Christianity, in uh, establishing and running schools and hospitals, in works of charity, and so on. And, you know, to their credit and to our chagrin, organizationally the Roman Catholic Church in the country is united, whereas Orthodoxy is not. And I think, you know, that's not to our credit here. We should be united at this point, and we're not. So, um, so I just want to say that in terms of um, this is, I'm going to be talking about differences, but I can, we cannot say we're in a position to judge individual Catholics. We, we're just in a position to say here's some things that, you know, concern us. So let me go on in that spirit. So first, approach to theology. So I just have a title slide. The next slide, we get into it. So <laughs> in, ortho, in the Orthodox Church, theology is a matter of our personal salvation. It, it's not a philosophical exercise. Orthodox theology is always, at its core, a means to an end, which is mystical union with God. Thus, theology should be quite practical. It's about expressing ineffable mysteries, but the, with a very particular goal, namely attaining to union with God. And for this reason, because we are so concerned about attaining to union with God, theology is taken very seriously. Outside of the truth protected by the church, personal interpretation and experience would be a mingling of truth and falsehood. And the journey towards theosis, toward attaining union with God, would be threatened because it's easy to be fooled by demons. So in the Orthodox Church, there's very strong warnings about making oneself the arbiter of truth and about spiritual delusions, about the possibility of being fooled by demons, even via visions that seem to be from God and that seem only good. In fact, I'll talk about, uh, I'll just mention one story St. Paisios used to bring up. He, he, he talked about a woman who had a true vision from God, and then the devil suggested to her a thought that she would, had been chosen by God to receive visions, and she believed that whisper. And then the demon started to torment her with different visions and revelations. And then at some point, she had another vision and was told to write to St. Paisio so that he could help her. And St. Paisio said of all her visions, there were only two of them that were from God. He issued that as a warning about these kinds of things. Now, again, what, you know, I'm going to keep saying this over and over, but the point is to protect the truth so we can attain to unity with God. This is the reason that the church had intense struggles with, about false doctrine over the centuries that we've talked about in previous lectures. Deviations from the truth threaten the ability of a person in attaining theosis. And, you know, on the topic of, of theology, we Orthodox hold very firmly to what we read in the, in the Epistle of Jude, verse 3, where St. Jude writes, 
I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In the Orthodox Church, we don't place any trust in arguments or reason as a way to discover truth. We affirm that not only is human reason too limited to grasp you know, certain divine truths, but also it's flawed. It's been wounded in the fall. And so there's, uh, you know, there's a, a tendency to error in our reason. We wouldn't want to trust it. And so the goal of Orthodox theology is not understanding the dogma per se, but rather how to live the dogma, which, as I mentioned, is full of unfathomable fathomable mystery, so that instead of understanding the mystery, we are transformed by it. The point of theology is theosis, and that's the same as the point of the church, the, the same as the point of the Holy Scriptures and our spirituality. It's all about that. The Scriptures aren't, we don't view the Scriptures as a collection of facts that, you know, lead, that we can sort out and lead to a, kind of a long chain of more and more deductions from that. It's just not the way Orthodox theology proceeds. Instead, Orthodox theology is very mystical at its heart, which means its goal, as I said, is an actual experience of God. And there's no theology without mysticism, hence the Vladimir Lasky's title of his book, A Personal Experience of the Truth and a Personal Mystical Encounter with God. That's what the theology's goal is. And, and interestingly, who does the church call theologians? In the Orthodox Church, theologians, properly speaking, are the saints. It's not someone who's gone to seminary, not someone who has a PhD. It's someone who knows how to pray. It's someone who has actually attained to sainthood and understand things by direct revelation, by experience with God personally. And for that reason, uneducated people could become theologians in the Orthodox Church, and have. Next slide. The other thing about our theology is that it's profoundly <coughs> apophatic which is defined as negative, but what does that mean? It means that orthodox theology starts with a very strong understanding that God is absolutely incomprehensible beyond all human understanding. Thus, he's by his very nature unknowable. And we cannot ever know his nature. We have finite minds, we can't conceive of things that are utterly beyond our understanding. So if you think you're seeing God and yet you know what you see, then you have not seen God in himself, but something intelligible that's inferior to him. If you think you can comprehend him, you know, you cannot know God if you think you're going to be able to comprehend him. And so if we wish to be united to God, we have to understand that he's incomprehensible. Now, of course, this doesn't mean there's no role for positive theology, but it does mean positive theology can only take us so far. And at that point, we have to leave reason behind, and we have to seek God in silence and uh, not try to understand or think we can understand him. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So then we, we can contrast that to the approach in theology in the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Catholic Church approach to theology is positive. It's not apophatic. And it's almost entirely rational, built upon philosophy and scholasticism. To quote a former Catholic priest, theology in the Catholic West seems to be largely a matter of precise definition and syllogistic deduction, highly philosophical and rationalist in nature. And this emphasis in uh, Roman C Catholic theology goes all the way back to Augustine. Augustine tried to resolve theological questions using reason and logical deduction, and he believed truth could not conflict with reason. Aquinas took this further. His goal was to merge Catholic dogma with Aristotelian logic. And of course, in this endeavor, reason is going to be central. So the goal is to understand logically the revelation of God using the methodology of philosophy. The viewpoint is that doctrine must be logical and scientific in order to be believable. And the method is theological deductions. Reason becomes the criterion of truth. And in fact, you can see, you know, as it's a fundamentally intellectual and scholastic approach, one could be an atheist and still be a perfectly fine theologian from this point of view. <clears throat> now, 
technically speaking, I want to you know, em- you know, make it clear that the Roman Catholic Church does teach that there are natural and supernatural truths. And it teaches that natural truth can be understood philosophically, like you can prove the existence of God, for example, but there's un- supernatural truths like the Trinity, which you can't prove, but neither can you disprove. That's the point of view of the Roman Catholic Church. As an example of um, popes you know, talking about this, Pope John Paul II put faith and reason on the same level. He called them two wings through which we ascend to contemplation of truth. And in the same statement later, he equated knowing the truth with knowing God. Thus, we call the Roman Catholic Church approach rationalist, not just rational, but subject to the demands of human rationality. And so human reason becomes, you know, not a tool, but rather a criterion of truth. Now, I want to say it's not like there's no mystical or mysticism in Roman Catholicism at all. There is, but it's just not the emphasis in their theology. And, you know, so, of course, if we were going to be technical, we would say uh, academic theologians are religious philosophers or perhaps students of theology rather than theology. Now, this is not to say the Orthodox Church is anti-intellectual. It's not anti-intellectual. It values reason. It has a strong intellectual tradition. But it doesn't view reason as necessary. And as I've said many times before, and I'm going to be talking about next lecture, we're comfortable with mystery, with something you know, that we can hold to be true, even if it's beyond our ability to understand it. So like the Trinity or the efficacy of the sacraments, you know, how that all works out. The other th- that leads naturally, I think, to development of doctrine. So the Roman Catholic Church accepts development of doctrine. Now, in its own understanding, it would say we don't come up with new dogma, but we, you know, we assert that Rome has, in fact, introduced new dogmas. So we would say over the centuries, dogmas appear that in Roman Catholicism that were absent in previous centuries, such as papal infallibility and the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. And we're going to talk about some of those um, ones, important ones below. So if you want to think about this from a software point of view, Roman, Cath- Roman Catholic theology develops over time and it includes innovations that are not backwards compatible. So a good Catholic from 200 years ago could be in danger of excommunication today. For example, papal infallibility was denied by many Catholic bishops until the official definition of the dogma in 1870 at the First Vatican Council. Now this denial is grounds for excommunication. Note that an implication of this viewpoint is something I've mentioned before, that the Roman Catholic Church better understands the truth, and has a higher level of knowledge than the church fathers, who themselves had a better level of knowledge than the apostles themselves. The Orthodox Church practices the development of expression of dogma, but not the meaning and substance of those dogmas. For the truths themselves, as I said, we hold, were given to the apostles in their fullness. And so Orthodox dogmatic formulation and councils is primarily a pastoral response to heresy, a clarifying of truths that are already held by the church, not an opportunity to godify new new theology or new speculation. And the interesting thing, too, is orthodox dogmas never claim to expound the whole truth about anything, but only delineates the borders of the mystery. And, uh, you know, after the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants, you know, Adopt, it would be very natural, and of course they did. They adopted this approach to theology and doctrine without you know, any guidance of tradition. But we would say because of that approach to theology and doctrine, in fact, the Protestants and Roman Catholic Church are much closer to each other along this dimension than the Roman Catholic Church is to the Orthodox Church. I just want to say, yeah, next slide, a couple more points on... on uh, interesting points on theology. In reality, there's actually a wide variety of opinions on theology within Catholicism, although in theory there shouldn't be because it's very centralized and it should all be in line with the Vatican, but in practice, you know, Catholics hold a wide variety of views about things. The second thing is, I think it's interesting that uh, because of our approach to theology, there's significant frustration that both the Protestants and also the Roman Catholic Church have in dialogues with us. you know, that we resist definitions and we are not going to engage in argumentation. So, for example, 13th century already, they do not understand what is said to them with reasons, but always adhere to some counsel or other. 
and to what has been handed down to them by their predecessors. That was the accusation he leveled against us. And we're like, that's right. <laughs> okay, that's uh, what all I'm going to say about theology. Now let's talk about spirituality and practice. So our spirituality has many things in common. We both strongly hold to the centrality of the Eucharist for the purification of soul and for drawing close to God. We both stress the necessity of corporate prayer and corporate worship and also personal prayer. We both stress works of charity as part of our spirituality. There's an ascetical element to both, although this has been relaxed a great deal in the Roman Catholic Church in the 20th century, and I'll come back to that. But there's some difference too, differences as well. Some of these are kind of minor things maybe, and some of them are more significant. You can probably guess one way that the Orthodox Church spirituality is going to differ from Roman Catholic spirituality, and that is an emphasis on reason is going to lead naturally to a reason-centered spirituality. So there's going to be much more use of reason. And, um, you know, there's a, a tendency to focus on learning as a path to God, on scholarship, and on the imagination. In fact, the, the popular Roman Catholic Lenten devotion, the Stations of the Cross, is focused on imagining being present with Christ at various points in his passion. Now, this type of imagination is, is strongly discouraging the Orthodox Church. The teaching is that it's too easy for the demons to insert thoughts into our minds. Also, Roman Catholic spirituality tends to be legalistic, although this can be a problem for both of us. But to, just to take one example, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's a sin not to fast, while uh, well, the Orthodox Church views fasting as a tool. As another example of the legalistic approach, one can find detailed lists of how to obtain indulgences out of purgatory. We'll talk about purgatory a bit later, just a little bit about it, though. And also, you know, for example, you're probably familiar with the teaching that there's an, it's possible to get an annulment of marriage, which is a legal, legalistic way of circumventing the prohibition against divorce. It may be helpful to emphasize, I've talked about this before, the Orthodox Church views itself as a hospital for the soul to cure the wounds brought about by our sin. Salvation is about our personal transformation to become healed and cleansed of our passions, acquiring virtues and becoming godly, attaining, to, as I said, to mystical union with God. And so, I, you know, this is my own personal bias, but I would argue Orthodox spirituality, you know, at least seems to me to be more balanced with its emphasis on body, mind, and soul. And also there's an emphasis that, you know, to pay heed to one's spiritual father or mother. So as a kind of protection of, of being fooled um, by things that we could, be, we could be tricked by. All right, let's take, to, take some specific examples that I think are pretty interesting. So our personal prayer life, the, the, in the preeminent Roman Catholic Church, prayer for personal use is the rosary. And if you can see, you know, I don't, I don't think you should necessarily take time reading this, but it tells you which, you know, prayers to read at every t particular point. So you start by, by reading the Apostles' Creed, then you say the Our Father, you have three Hail Marys, and so on. So if I did my counting correctly, <clears throat> you would be saying the Our Father of the Lord's Prayer six times in the Rosary. You would, you would say six times a doxology, which is glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Um, then there's five prayers specifically addressed to Christ, and then 53 Hail Marys. Now, in Orthodox prayers, you know, we ask for the prayers of the Mother of God as well, but our preeminent prayer for personal use is the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, or sometimes a shortened version of this. So an Orthodox Christian is encouraged to have a prayer rule that would consist of an introductory prayer. Uh, for example, uh, we, would, we would have glory to the Father said three times. Uh, there's a prayer called Heavenly King. Uh, there's three times we would recite Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. We would say Our Father. We would say Lord have mercy 12 times. And then we would have a certain number of other prayers that could be variously addressed to the Holy Trinity or to Christ or to our guardian angel or to the Mother of God. And then we would have a certain number of Jesus prayers. And we would have a, a prayer rope to help us keep track. So it might be 33 prayer, um, Jesus prayers or 50 or 100 or, you know, depending on your prayer rule and how <laughs> your level of ability, I guess, it might be more than that. 
And then, as I mentioned, there should also be a time of silence at some point in your prayer roll, which I have a really hard time with, by the way. So, but, okay, so that's, that's our uh, personal prayer differences. Now here's another big difference, of which is called hesychasm. So hesychasm literally means to keep stillness. And it's decidedly non-rational. You're trying to quiet your mind and bring yourself into the presence of God in deep humility and, pre- and repentance. And so, like I said, it's you know, considered good practice to spend part of your prayer rule in silence. Not using your imagination, though. And we teach, actually, that someone who's very close to sainthood, if not an actual saint, then that person may experience direct communion with God and have the experience of Mount Tabor, the very same experience as that the apostles, the three apostles had on Mount Tabor when Christ revealed the glory of God to him. This would be the very same experience um, that the person would be partaking of the uncreated light of God. Now, this is what we aspire to, although, you know, very few of us attain to that. That's what we aspire to. And this is actually expressly, explicitly denied. This possibility is explicitly denied in the Roman Catholic Church. So I would say that's kind of a big difference. Next one. Now here's one that's a kind of interesting. The sign of the cross. <clears throat> so in Roman Catholicism now, the sign of the cross is done with an open hand. You start on your head, you go to your tummy, then you go to your left shoulder, then you go to your right shoulder. Now, in orthodoxy, you don't have an open hand. You take your three fingers and put them together, and the other two are curled under like that. This is expressing that the three fingers are expressing the doctrine of the Trinity, and the two fingers are expressing the two natures of Christ. And then you start again on the forehead and then the tummy, and then you go from right to left. Now, why do we do this differently? Well, interestingly... We, ha- we did this the same through the 13th century. And how do we know this? It's because we have a catechism written by Pope Innocent III who gave explicit instructions on how to make the sign of the cross, and it's the orthodox way. But sometime in the 15th or 16th century in the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church switched. And we don't know why. Next thing, mu- uh, music. So there's a bit of a difference in, in the use of music and liturgy. So orthodox music is typically fairly simple. And actually, at one point in the early church forbade the use of harmony because they were worried about emotional manipulation. Now, today there's use of some use of harmony in orthodox music, but there's almost never instruments. Now, there's a couple exceptions. Um, Some Greek churches in the U.S. Sometimes we'll use the organ a little bit. Um, Very occasionally in Africa, occasionally you'll see drums used. Now here's a picture of a Coptic church, so it looks like they're using a particular instrument there in their worship. Whereas in Roman Catholicism, of course, instruments are used, and the music can be quite in- in- intricate and ornate. <coughs> and <coughs> that, that brings to continuity versus change in the literature. So there's been very big changes in the Roman Catholic Church Mass in the 20th century. Um, so the normal worship of a typical Catholic changed a lot between, say, 1950 and 1980. The Mass was totally changed, and a lot, so, you know, a lot of other things were changed in the worship. Now, so that amount of change, the Orthodox Church never experienced anything like that. Certainly, you know, we experienced some change over the centuries, but it typically was very slow and almost never major. So someone like from the... from the year 300 could come in the, in the church on Sunday, and they would recognize the parts of our liturgy. Next slide. That brings us... Oh, yeah, so this, this was a, a celebration of, um, I guess, Mexican music in a liturgy. And this one here, if it, you can find this on YouTube. The priest is blessing his, the, the faithful with his guitar instead of using a cross. Okay, by the way, I don't know if the Pope or the official, his bishop would approve of that or not, but that sort of thing can happen. I'm going to come to some other examples later. Okay, that brings us to asceticism and fasting. So it used to be the Roman Catholic Church had kind of a rigorous, moderately rigorous 
fasting tradition. But again, in the, in the 20th century, there was a very big change in, in fasting. It was almost completely set aside. So now, in the Roman Catholic Church, the only time you have to fast is on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday and Fridays in Lent. And that cons your fast consists of not eating meat and smaller portions. And in fact, they even got rid of fasting before liturgy in the morning on Sundays. I mean, there's a few hours of fasting or something, but it's pretty, you know, you basically can eat breakfast. Um, now, you've probably heard of Catholics giving up things for Lent, so many Catholics do that, and that's, I presume, encouraged, but it's not required. And of course, you know, like many other things I'll talk about, you know, there's some devout Roman Catholics who fast very rigorously. You know, they'll have twice a week, only bread and water, for example. But that's not required by Roman Catholicism. Now, Orthodox Christian who's really following what's expected of us will actually end up fasting about a third of the year. And what that means for us would be eating vegan, and some, on some days you would also give up wine and oil um, and alcohol, or at least wine. So that, you know, having said that, doesn't mean that all Orthodox are following that practice. Some are good at fasting, some aren't as good. But nonetheless, the expectations haven't really changed that much. And as I said before, in, in Orthodoxy, it's not a sin not to fast. We view fasting as a tool to help us overcome our passions and to draw closer to God. So basically, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't fast. <laughs> Next one. So that brings us now to uh, differences in the way the sacraments are expressed. Or so the first one is a confession. Now in the Roman Catholic Church, you make your confession to a priest who then, he himself absolves a sin and typically will issue penances to you. Now confession was previously done in the confession booth, but there were some problems with that, so now today it's, it's done somehow in the open. It's not hidden from sight. Uh, in the Orthodox Church, you make your confession to Christ in the presence of a priest, and then the priest will pronounce Christ's absolution of the sin, and it's rare in Orthodoxy for the priest to issue any penances. I also want to say, by the way, on this slide that you can see another difference between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Quite often, uh, Roman Catholic priests will be clean-shaven, whereas it's fairly rare in Orthodoxy. Uh, most Orthodox priests will have a beard, and many will have a long beard, and many will have long hair as well. Okay, that brings us to baptism. So the Roman Catholic Church changed the, f the form and the wording of the, of the sacrament. The Orthodox Church uses triple immersion, so the baby gets dunked completely three times. Now, if it's a grown person and the baptismal font isn't big enough, then the person may not be dunked, but... That's kind of the goal, is to have a triple immersion. And then, and then you know, the, the Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, the Middle Ages changes to one immersion, and then later, sorry, I don't know when they changed it to single immersion, but it, by the Middle Ages, this was changed to pouring, so that's the practice today. In the Orthodox Church, the wording is, the servant of God is baptized, so it kind of indicates the Holy Spirit is doing this through the priest, Whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, the priest says, I baptize you, you know, it kind of places the authority in the priest at that point. And this immediately brings us to chrismation. So in the Orthodox Church, there's a trilogy of things that happen either in immediate sequence or very close. Once you're baptized, immediately you're chrismated, which means you receive the chrism or the holy oil. And then very soon, like that day, maybe in the same service, or maybe the next day you're going to receive the Eucharist. So they're all kind of close together in, in time, right? At most, what, a 24- or 26-hour period in between them. So a baby, for example, fully participates in the life of the church. Now, in Roman Catholicism, they do practice infant baptism, baptism as you saw on the previous slide, but chrismation or confirmation occurs when you're a teenager, and it's done without oil. In the Roman Catholic Church, kids, baptized kids, don't partake of the Eucharist at all until they're six or seven. So, tongue-in-cheek a bit, kids are excommunicated for the first seven years of their life. 
And I would say that given our, you know, our shared view about the importance of the Eucharist, we would say that's a very big deal that kids are not able to take the, uh, partake of communion. And that brings us to communion or the Eucharist. So these, these, are, these sacraments are done differently in the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. So the Orthodox Church uses leavened bread, which is a risen loaf, to symbolize the resurrection of Christ. Then we teach that, the, as I've said before, we teach that the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ, but they don't cease to be bread and wine. This is a, is a mystery, and we don't try to explain it. Now, in terms of partaking of the Eucharist, the presbyter and the deacon partake of the Eucharist in a different way than the faithful do, but from the same loaf and the same cup as everyone else. For the laity, the body of Christ is placed into the chalice, which contains the blood of Christ, and then the presbyter uses a spoon to place a small spoonful into the person's mouth. So everyone's partaking of the same bread and the same wine. Now, the Roman Catholic Church conversely uses unleavened bread, and it teaches that the bread and wine cease to be bread and wine once they're consecrated, even though they still look like bread and wine. And maybe it's because unleavened bread is hard to break, so this practice arose, but now the laity get unfractured, disassociated pieces. They're like these little circles with a cross. I think it has a cross on it. Some uh, parishes allow the faithful to receive communion in their hands, although I believe that's contrary to Roman Catholic teaching. Now, what about the wine? So this doesn't look like there's any wine here. Now, prior to 1969 in the Roman Catholic Church, you would only receive a wafer of the body of bread, but not partake of the cup. Now, the official teaching is because the wine and bread have been changed into the body and blood of Christ, they're not separated. So even though it looks like bread, it's really both body and blood of Christ. Thus, the reasoning goes the faithful don't need to partake of the cup. And that's still the case today. Most parishes practice that, although I think it was in 1969, um, this practice was changed. So in some parishes, after you partake of the bread, you can also take care partake wine from the chalice. So that's a difference. Okay, next slide, please. Another difference is married versus unmarried clergy. So in the Orthodox Church, presbyters and deacons can be married, and most are, although bishops must be unmarried. Now what about Roman Catholic Church? This was something that started rising very, very early in the West, that this notion that priests shouldn't be married, or if they are married, and then they become priests, they have to become celibate after that. Now, the Patriarch of Rome tried to get this inserted into the First Ecumenical Council. <clears throat> but the church affirmed this was not the teaching of the apostles. And this stance in the First Ecumenical Council was reaffirmed in the Sixth Council, where they explicitly pointed to a local council that tried to ins instate the Western point of view and say, no, that's not the teaching of the church. But despite this clear teaching in two councils, the Roman Catholic Church insists that all clergy must be unmarried. Next slide, please. Okay, that brings us to um, another interesting similarities and differences between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Namely, stigmata, apparitions of the Mother of God, incorrupt saints, and weep weeping icons. What are stigmata? So stigmata are bodily marks and and or scars or pains or blood flow that correspond to the crucifixion wounds of Christ. So, for example, having blood drip from your hand. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi is the first example of someone in the Roman Catholic Church who experienced this, but the Roman Catholic Church attests to about 300 instances of this. And these are foreign to Orthodox experience. And and I don't think Roman Catholics had any before the schism either. So that's stigmata we don't share in common. What about apparitions? Well, numerous Catholic faithful have reported a visual and also oral encounter with the Mother of God over the centuries. Most of these happen after the Great Schism. One in Guadalupe in 1531 involved the placement of a miraculous image on a cloak. 
At least two of these apparitions, namely Fatima in 1917 <clears throat> and Medjugorje starting in 1981, which by the way, that apparition is still continuing to this day. There were seven people who received the apparitions and um, I think one is receiving apparitions every day still and one is receiving them every month and um, others you know, less frequently than that. These both involve children or teens and and in both of those, prophetic secrets were communicated. So the, the three secrets from Fatima have been communicated to the faithful, but the ten secrets in Medjugorje have not yet. They all refer to end times, and so it's not time yet for them to be revealed. Now, the Catholic Church, what's their teaching on this? They, they teach that true apparitions of Mary do occur, but they also believe there's many claimed apparitions that are false or that are the result of something other than God. So for this reason, they actually have a formal evaluation process, you know, established for, for assessing claimed apparitions. And there's multiple criteria. There's the sincerity and moral uprightness of the people, the theological accuracy of the messages, and if there's positive fruits coming from the event. And sometimes they won't even comment on whether the apparition itself is true or not, but they'll just approve of the religious practices that are being encouraged by that apparition. Now, there have been a few orthodox apparitions. I think these tend not to involve speaking. And I have heard of instances where individual orthodox people didn't see the mother of God, but they heard her speak to them in their mind, convicting them of a specific sin. Now, orthodox hierarchs don't comment on Catholic apparitions. There are, however, as I said, many warnings about apparitions and experiences. And the holy elders and saints who pray continually, continually tell us of fake apparitions that they themselves have experienced, that they tested and found to be of demonic origin. Now, incorrupt bodies. So both Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy have saints with incorrupt bodies. That is, the person is, dies, but their body never decomposes. So this is actually Archbishop Dimitri, is it, Father, in Texas? Yeah. Some bodies of Orthodox saints smell fragrant, and some even weep myrrh. That brings me to weeping icons and weeping statues. So as you know, the artwork in most Roman Catholic churches you know, tends to be heavy on, on uh, um, statues. And there are some weeping statues in Roman Catholicism. The vast majority of weeping statues, though, have been declared as hoaxes by the Roman Catholic Church. There are several miraculous Orthodox icons within Orthodoxy that weep myrrh and that have been the sources of many miracles. I personally have seen two of these. One of them wept myrrh very, very slowly, but the other one was kind of like one drip per second. So that was quite an experience. And I think I mentioned that in my talk about my painful conversion to orthodoxy, how the mother of God made me wait for my, <laughs> made me sweat it out because I needed it. All right, that brings me now to what you've all been waiting for, major doctrinal issues. And the first one and the big one is the filioque, which means Latin for <laughs> and the son. So this is an addition to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And it defines the eternal presence we should, oh, actually, let me go through these a second. What we're going to talk about is filioque, papal supremacy, papal infallibility. We're going to skip absolute divine simplicity. That's just too technical, I think, to get into. Original sin, salvation, merit, satisfaction, purgatory, and indulgences. Then I think it's especially pertinent today to talk about war. And then finally, the Immaculate Conception. So filioque. Thank you. So this is Latin for and the son. This is an addition to the creed, as I said. And what it does is it defines the eternal procession or the origin of the Holy Spirit as being not only from the Father, but also from also the Son. In other words, the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Now, this is an enormous, the, enormous theological problem because... <coughs> It's at the heart of Christian theology, namely the persons of the Holy Trinity. The actual creed follows the teaching of Christ himself, uh, you know, who said the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And it violates the nature of the Trinity. 
And notice, you know, if, if the Holy Spirit proceeds through both the Father and the Son, then this kind of subordinates the Spirit, and the two persons of the Trinity, namely the Father and the Son, share something that the Holy Spirit doesn't. And some have even suggested, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but some have suggested that this implicit subordination of the Holy Spirit is why, is part of the reason that Rome puts church unity and infallibility in the hands of the Pope, when we say church unity and infallibility are in the hands of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's also a problem because changing the creed is a sin against the unity of the church. And in fact, it's kind of interesting, historically, Rome itself originally objected to this alteration. Several popes anathematized changes, any changes to the creed. One pope, in reaction to hearing this, forbade its use and famously had the original creed without the addition, inscribed in both Latin and Greek on silver tablets at the tomb of St. Peter. Now, these have been moved, but you can still see them, I'm told. So that's one big difference. Another big difference, you know, which I've talked about before, is papal supremacy. So the next two things, uh, you know, are both ecclesiastical things, and they're two papal dogmas. Now, before I talk about this anymore, I found out something quite recently which I thought was quite interesting. Um, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has to take a hard line on these teachings and it has to assert, yeah, these have always been true. But some of their own very notable scholars don't agree with this. So, for example, there's a Latin scholar and priest, Dr. Richard Price. <clears throat> He's a professor of history and Christianity at Haythrop College in London. He's a priest within the Archdiocese of Westminster. And his major works include or consist of very popular translations of Theodoret of Cyrus, the Acts of the Councils of Chalcedon and Constantinople, Nicaea II, and the Lateran Synod of 649. So he's clearly an expert in these councils. And usually he's a very staunch defender of the Roman Catholic position. What did he say? He said, he has five points in this uh, one podcast he had. First, the East did not recognize or believe papal infallibility nor papal supremacy. The East did want to maintain good relations with old Rome. Second, the East regarded the Bishop of Rome as a senior bishop out of respect for his office. Three, the East did not require papal ratification for ecumenical synods, nor did the East believe that any ecumenical synods required affirmation by the Bishop of Rome to be validated. The East wanted Old Rome's approval so that the decrees could be circulated in the West by Old Rome. They wanted the church to be of one mind. Four, the East believed the emperor called ecumenical synods and instituted their decrees as law, as God's co-ruler and the guardian of the church. And five, the East, Eastern provinces did not recognize Old Rome's jurisdiction. So these are kind of interesting statements coming from a very respected Roman Catholic theologian. Anyway, papal supremacy. So what is the teaching? It's the team that, teaching that the Pope of Rome has supreme, immediate, and universal dis jurisdiction over every Christian, that he has jurisdictional power everywhere, that he's the head over all the other patriarchs, that he's the head of the church. So this dogma puts the Pope above every council, above every other human being, and the Roman Catholic Church anathematizes anyone who rejects it. Now the argument they have is that this authority comes from St. Peter, who supposedly appointed first Bishop of Rome. There's actually no evidence he himself was ever the Bishop of Rome. Rejection of this dogma is taught to endanger your salvation, so if you don't submit to the Pope, you won't be saved. However, interestingly, Pope John Paul seemed to think otherwise as he seemed to have said that all Christians were Roman Catholic without knowing it. So anyway, we, we reject this teaching of, teaching of papal supremacy on several grounds. I mean, first ground is we don't find it in the fathers. Second, we believe that Christ is the head of the church, not any bishop. Christ does not need a vicar because he's always present in the church. Third, we disagree about the role of St. Peter. So there's a lot to say on this point. First, in Holy Scripture, St. Peter's never described as the head of the church. Conversely, 
Christ is described as the head of the church in both the epistles of Ephesians and the epistle to the Colossians. Next point, we know that St. Peter was the first bishop of Antioch before he went to Rome, where there's, as I said, no indication he was ever a bishop, although we know he died there. Getting back to St. Peter, now there's some who see a special role for him when, when Christ said, you know, you are the rock, I give you the keys of the kingdom, but the same keys are given to all the apostles in John 20. Furthermore, the Lord describes himself, not Peter, as holding those keys in Revelations 1, verse 18. So the idea that Peter's sole successor is a Roman bishop and that he has exclusive access to the keys, that's not a teaching of scripture. Now we agree that St. Peter was the chief of the apostles and that's how we honor him. But we see all Orthodox patriarchs and all Orthodox bishops as sitting in the chair of Peter. As I said earlier, St. Peter was never called the head of the church in any sense in the Bible, nor did he himself ever appeal to supposed papal authority, even in his own epistles. St. Paul certainly didn't recognize special authority when he opposed Peter to his face over Peter's temporary acceptance of Judaizing, and we read about that in Galatians 2. <clears throat> nor did Paul seem to need Peter's permission to write a pastoral epistle to the church in Rome. In fact, he didn't even mention Peter in those greetings. And if St. Peter was the head of the church, we would have expected him to preside over the council in Acts. But in fact, it was Jacob, or James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem. And very naturally, because the council was held in his territory. And so Jacob was the one that presided. Church history also shows that councils trump the papacy over and over. None of the ecumenical councils recognize the supposed supremacy of the Pope. Yes, they showed honor to the Bishop of Rome and often sought support from him when other bishops were being wobbly. At the Fourth Council, they actually defined Rome's supremacy as one of honor, not of supremacy, and explicitly stated that this was because it was the imperial city, not, you know, St. Peter was never even mentioned then. Another point is Rome's claim to supremacy has both practical and theological problems. Realistically, if the Pope has immediate and absolute authority everywhere, then he's essentially the only real bishop in the whole world. All the other bishops are not bishops, but mainly vicars of him. Interestingly, the Pope of Rome in 590 to 604, St. Gregory the Great, even warned against calling himself universal bishop and said, anyone who did so or desired this title is by his pride a precursor to the Antichrist. Another point, the word Catholic comes from the Greek word katholikos, probably mispronounced, which does not mean universal, it means according to the whole. We Orthodox hold that this wholeness resides in every diocese with its bishop. The parishes and dioceses are not merely parts of the Catholic Church, but rather manifest that Catholic, Catholicity within themselves fully and locally. We also teach that every bishop is fundamentally equal. Some have more positional or, or ecclesiastical or administrative authority, I'm sorry, but that's not the kind of authority. It's, it's very different kind of authority than the sort of authority that the Pope holds over the Roman Catholic Church. Then finally, papal supremacy has been a problem historically. So for instance, between 1378 and 1417, there was a lot of upheaval and there were multiple competing claimants to the papacy. At one point, there were three. Now, this problem can't be resolved by an appeal to papal power. Who's the real pope? So a council had to decide. This council declared that ecumenical councils were higher than popes. So I probably said enough about that. Let's go to the next slide. Papal infallibility. So this teaching is that the pope is held to be infallible in questions of faith and morals when he is speaking ex cathedra or from the throne. This was affirmed by the first Vatican Council in 1870. The Pope is therefore thought to have some special gift of the Holy Spirit, which protects him from teaching heresy. Note that there's no teaching that says it keeps him from being sinless. This is only about pronouncements of doctrine. And these pronouncements are not subject to any kind of review or consent by the church. Now, despite what it sounds like, I'm told that in reality it's very difficult for the Pope to make an infallible pronouncement. 
Right now, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't even have a list of the infallible pronouncements made by popes. So it's kind of problematic dogma in practice. But not only that, there's clear historical and scriptural problems. First, you know, we don't find it in the Fathers. It's not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. It wasn't appealed to in St. Peter's, St. Paul's rebuke of St. Peter. And in fact, St. Peter was wrong doctrinally, and he was being corrected. Also, why would you need to have a council to, to decide things? Just go to the Pope. So we didn't see that happening in the early church or in the first century. You know, that would be the time that you would make use of this gift of the Holy Spirit. Another problem is the following. Suppose the Pope is a heretic, which Rome admits is possible. Who has the authority to depose that heretical Pope? So the Orthodox Church holds that no individual, not even a saint, is infallible. It places infallibility in the whole body of the church, not in the hands of any one person. And if a bishop or a patriarch is a heretic, he will be deposed. And this has happened on a number of occasions. All right, we're skipping absolute divine simplicity, bringing us to original sin. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that original sin, including the guilt of Adam and Eve, is transmitted to humans via sexual reproduction. So I think it's safe to say the Roman Catholic Church has views, you know, sexual relations as a kind of a taint in, in that it always involves the evil of lust. And perhaps this is part of the motivation for requiring priests to be unmarried. But Roman Catholic teaching is that all people are implicated in Adam's sin. They're all born guilty. The Orthodox Church teaches that we suffer the consequences of that sin, including death. We're born with illness of sin. We're born prone to die, but we're not guilty of that sin. We're only guilty of our own sins. And we don't teach that sex in itself is sinful. Next one. So this is on salvation, merit, satisfaction, purgatory, and indulgences. And here's the Roman Catholic Church teaching. So the Roman Catholic Church understands original sin in legal terms and salvation in legal terms. Sin is a crime against God, and he requires a just sentence. So even after sins are forgiven, the sinner still has to pay for them with punishment. God is said to require satisfaction both for the guilt of the sin and for the debt that the believer owes God in payment, and the believer has to merit his or her salvation. He or she has to pay the punishment due for his sins in purgatory. What is purgatory? Purgatory is a place of suffering, and you stay in that for whatever amount of time it takes for you to pay your debt. However, well, let's read this here. Purgatory is a place or condition of temporal punishment for those who have not fully paid the satisfaction due to their transgressions. That's from the Catholic Encyclopedia. <clears throat> However, the suffering of purgatory may be lessened by gaining indulgences. So an indulgence allows some of the merit of Jesus or of the extra merit of the saints to be applied as payment to your account. Or you can prepay some of that by doing penances and accumulating merit yourself. Indulgences give you a reduced amount of time in purgatory. Now, in previous centuries, you could buy indulgences directly. And this was you know, one of the main arguments or one of the main complaints in the Protestant Reformation. It was the kind of abuse of indulgences and the indulgence system. And actually, today even also, you can pay to reduce the punishment of someone else. And also, the Pope can grant indulgences to people, which, you know, Martin Luther raised the question, look, if the Pope can do this, why doesn't he just do it out of Christian love? Why would he wait for you to pay for that? So to say this in a different way in Roman Catholic teaching, Christ's death was required to satisfy God's anger at our sins. This is part of the satisfaction God requires, but honor also demands a second form of satisfaction, this punishment thing. And you can work it off by performing penances the priest imposes or by doing your self-imposed penances like prayer, alms, giving, fasting, etc., and by patiently enduring the sufferings and trials sent by God. Now, the Orthodox Church does not deny, but neither does it emphasize the debt or crime language we see occasionally in Scripture. In Orthodoxy, there's no complex system of satisfaction, merit, and indulgences, and we don't believe in purgatory. 
We don't teach that, we do not teach punishment for sins that are, have been forgiven. Forgiveness, we would say, cancels out any punishment. Our teaching on, on salvation reflects a bigger emphasis in scripture, which is repentance and healing. So for us to be saved is not to be freed from a sentence, rather it's to be transformed by God, to be restored to what it means to be human, to be a partaker in the divine nature. Thus our emphasis is on healing and transforming the human person. It's on becoming like Christ. That's what salvation is all about. And the word um, suzane, I guess it is in Greek, which is translated to save, also literally means to heal. So I think that's a beautiful um, connection between those two things. And we would say not even saints merit salvation. It's not Christ's merit that saves us, but rather our participation in him that saves us. And we believe the only way we can affect another person's life is by our prayers. Now, some church fathers believe in purification after death, but the character of this is not ever clarified. And for us, there's a very different distinction between heaven, hell, and purgatory. We teach that all cells all souls partake in the same eternity, but experience it differently depending on their spiritual state. For some people, there's bliss at being in the communion with God. There's purification for those in the process of being deified, and there's remorse and agony for those who have clung to sin and hated God their whole lives. Next one is, uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to war. There's some very big differences between the Roman Catholic view and the Orthodox view on war. Augustine was the first clear advocate of just war theory, which teaches that under some circumstances, war can be just. So there's this list of, you know, what would make a war just, what's the reason you're going to war, and how are you conducting the war. And in the Roman Catholic Church, bishops, priests, and monks have served in battle as fighters, and even a pope sometimes. So... We have this nice picture of, the, of Pope Julius II, who was from 1503, Pope of 1503 to 1513. Um, it was really hard to get that photo, uh, let me tell you. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church has officially sanctioned several military orders, and according to Wikipedia, there have been about 20 crusades that have been officially sanctioned not just about the Middle East. Now, the Orthodox Church teaches there's nothing just about war. Soldiers and armies can be blessed to defend the country, and in traditionally Orthodox countries, even weapons might be blessed, and whole battalions might have a patron saint, but the Orthodox Church won't even call a completely defensive war a just war. At best, war is a regrettable, unavoidable necessity, but it always falls in the category of sin. It's missing the mark. Even if it's absolutely necessary, it's still a sin. And the Orthodox Church actually calls for a period of penance for any combatant who's killed an enemy before they're allowed to partake in the Eucharist. I think it was St. Basil who said a penance of three full years. Now, it's not always exercise, but that's what the Church is calling for. And the other thing is um, a priest cannot be a combatant. An Orthodox priest, they can only be a chaplain. So they can be embedded with a unit, but they would have to be embedded as a chaplain and you know, not partake in that combat. Next slide, Immaculate Conception. So the Roman Catholic Church original sin doctrine... Oh, one, sorry. Thank you. It is kind of the origin, I think, of the Immaculate Conception teaching. So remember, the original sin says you inherit the guilt just by being born. And the Roman Catholic Church then teaching about the Immaculate Conception is that the Virgin Mary was preserved from all stain of original sin when she was conceived. And this was declared as a dogma in 1854. <clears throat> Although... It's quite interesting on this particular point, a major Roman Catholic saint and its biggest theologian, Aquinas, rejected explicitly in the 13th century. So kind of their top theologian said no. Now notice in this teaching, if it's teaching that she was immaculately conceived, which means basically she was protected from sin from birth. So she had no sin at all, and she had this protection. Now notice 
if that's the case, then the holiness of her holiness is of no credit to her. It was just given to her at birth. And it also raises the question, why did she die? And I think that's probably why there are some, you know, some people in the Roman Catholic Church who believe she didn't die. You know, by that logic, you would be incapable of death. And the other question it raises, of course, is why wouldn't God do this for everyone then? But, you know, that's merely logical rebuttals. We resist the teaching because we don't find it in the Fathers, and it appears to go against what we learn about the Theotokos in the Fathers and also in our worship. We believe the Virgin is worthy of praise because as a human, she freely agreed to do the will of God, no matter what the cost. Most of the Orthodox Church believes she became sinless as a little girl, but all of us believe she was sinless at least between the time of the Annunciation when the Holy Spirit descended upon her in the birth of Jesus. And that comes to some of the disturbing things that we've seen happen to the Catholic Church in the 20th century that, you know, I just was talking about a colleague at work today about this, who was shaking his head about this. Uh, so these are some of the excesses we see in the Roman Catholic Church today. And these things, by the way, are things that aren't, they're not unique to Roman Catholicism. They're kind of all over Christendom. And I think what I will say on this slide would be something devout Catholics would all agree with. You know, some sectors of the Roman Catholic Church have just wholesale accepted liberation theology, which tries to wed church doctrine to Marxism. And then these liturgical developments we talked about in the Second Vatican Council, Vatican Council you know, led to reform, in the, in, which happened, by the way, 62 to 65. There was a reform in their liturgics. <clears throat> now, the Council envisioned modest reforms, but that's not what actually happened. Instead, you know, this was taken as a go-ahead for all sorts of things and kind of a very large break with church tradition. So under the direction of a powerful cardinal, the, the core of the mass was changed, some of it with Protestant input, if you can believe that. Some of the moves we would applaud, like dropping Latin in favor of the local language and allowing the faithful to partake of the blood of Christ, the wine from the chalice, but, but most of them we don't favor. For, for instance, now the priest faces the people instead of everyone facing east most of the time. And this kind of tends to put a focus on the priest as sort of a master of ceremonies instead of someone leading the people to God. In addition to official changes, there have been a significant number of priests who have departed wildly from ancient practices, like you know, inter introducing dancing, enormous puppets, priests dressing up in costumes, and other showmanship that you know, I think leads to a loss of the sense of the sacred. And you know, something big is, you know, something bad is going on there. The other thing is the Pope has given permission for any Catholic who feels in his or her own conscience that he or she should be able to take the Eucharist may do so, even if they're living in grave sin. So this is kind of difficult to square with the teaching we have about the Eucharist that St. Paul gave to the church in Corinth. And that is what I have. So these are two books I'd recommend on, um, if you want to read more on this topic. And with that, open it up for questions. Maybe I'll know the answer to it. Yeah, so the right. So, so the question was, what's the difference in the signing of the the cross? So the yeah, the Roman Catholic Church makes the sign of the cross with an open hand, and then they start, you know, they go from the head to the forehead, and then they go to the left shoulder, and then to the right shoulder. The Orthodox squishes your three fingers together like this, same beginning, and then you go to the right shoulder, and then to the left shoulder. Well, I'm aware of the following. I'm aware of, uh, 
I think even several popes have said the creed without the filioque. That's happened. Um, I know that there are some parishes that are very reluctant. They want to stick to the old mass, the Latin mass. I don't know if they're allowed to do that or not. Um, I know that there's certainly a lot of interest, I think, on both sides for coming back together officially, but I think, you know, we would say there's just these enormous sticking points that we don't see a way. You know, how do you get past papal infallibility and papal supremacy? I mean, they teach those are dogma and you go to hell if you don't agree with them or like, you know, we're never going to agree to that. Um, He's going to give me a question I don't know the answer to. So I think the answer would be we've been accused of that, certainly. Um, I think, you know, there's some obvious cases like Christmas trees, which I've heard various accounts of. You know, I heard one bishop, I think, say, yeah, we just stole it. <laughs> we made it ours, you know. So, I mean, the, the dates of uh, Christmas, for example, a lot of these dates were explicitly chosen to land on the pagan holidays so that the people, the faithful would worship good stuff instead of bad stuff on those days, I guess. Um, but yeah, I've heard that accusation before, and I think uh, a lot of times, you know, the ones that I've heard anyway seem to be more like, you know, from our understanding, that's not what's happened. But, you know, if you were just kind of reading things naively, you might think, oh, these are similar. That must be what had happened. Um, but I don't have any, ex you know, details for you. Like, I mean, maybe the iconography, someone says, oh, you know, they took that from paganism or... You know, that there's a, mother, there's a mother who gave birth to a son that was just stolen from paganism. Well, if you think it's a myth, yeah, then you could say, oh, yeah, it was stolen from paganism. But if you think this actually happened, then, you know, that was just paganism pointed to something. God gave an idea to the pagans of here's something that's coming in the future. And it actually happened, you know. But I, I'm not an expert on that. Mm -hmm. Type of monasticism in the Orthodox. I mean, there's different practices of monasticism. There's, you know, there's monks that live in communities. There's the monks that live in small communities or they live hermits. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Roman Church, there's all these different orders of monasticism yep. with different emphases and different. Um, I just, I've, I've always found that fascinating how that transpired in the West and in the Orthodoxy. That doesn't really happen. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the point being raised that was mentioned is in um, orthodoxy, there's fundamentally one monasticism. It's expressed either in living communities or as a hermit, or you might start in one and move to the other. In Roman Catholicism, there's explicitly distinct orders. In fact, I heard there was like a thousand of them. Um, another interesting thing is monasticism is collapsing in the Roman Catholic Church, so it's like down 95%, um, whereas it's not you know, in orthodoxy. It may be dwindling. I'm not sure, Father, if you know, but I think it's pretty much alive and well still in orthodoxy. So it's just an interesting, you know, fact. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think domestically, the issue is domestically here in the United States, there's never been a real strong orthodox monastic presence. So something like Mount Athos, I mean, there, there was a period of in time where um, the monastic bursting at the seams at Mount Athos. The monastic republic in, uh, in Greece with uh, something like 21 different monasteries there. Um, but here, not so much. We can't really. And, I, and I think, again, I think that's part of the whole, there's so many different Orthodox churches and we can't mm -hmm. interact yet. So yeah. every different group trying to do something with monasticism. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's despite the average Orthodox is more educated and more wealthy than the average Catholic, you know. So, I mean, there's 71 million Catholics, I think, and 1 million Orthodox, so there's a big change in numbers, but still. We don't have 171th as much. We have a lot less than that, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. I've heard many devout Catholics lament, you know. The, the status. But like, you know, they, they have great prayer apps, you know, reflections, all that kind of stuff. There's just tons of that. We have some. It's not like we don't have any, but, you know. <laughs> called encounter the encounter, the encounter. Okay. check out father's iphone if you want to see it <laughs> <laughs> this just came out about a month ago yeah i get i have i use a, a greek orthodox app to give me the daily readings for the day and then i have like three or four different prayer apps on my phone because some of them have different you know phrasing or they have different prayers so a couple different ones I use a lot there's also a good one which is Chinese American so you, it's also in Chinese and in, a, and in English so you can switch between the two is it, is it this one that yes yeah uh, for bringing my aunt here again. <laughs> <laughs> But our ancient faith radio is pretty darn good out to say. Antiochian. <laughs> I do have a question about the catechism. Yeah. Desert Fathers that were doing it were saying you need to breathe and kind of go like do weird breathing and then you get lightheaded and you're supposed to like sit like this and this was an Orthodox, mm -hmm. was Orthodox and I thought well yeah I mean I guess I would maybe start to feel a little I don't know it just to me because I remember you said that you know we're not supposed to use our imagination because mm -hmm. that could invite demons yeah but I'm thinking that doing this and trying to get yourself lightheaded could be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then I wondered about like the light. Um, I don't know. I just like I, I I'm drawn to that, but I'm also because of my ex years of experience in yoga that I ran from because I knew it was demonic after a while. I yeah, it just feels too similar. So I think there was two questions there. I think one is. And Father, you can take these if you want. I think the one is, <clears throat> does the church teach us that we should do these particular ways of breathing to help us attain to this state? And the second question, I think, is, is that state similar to the kind of state you would get, for example, in Hinduism? So I would say, I've, you know, I'm not denying that you may have read this somewhere, but I've also read other people say, no, don't start going down that road. What you need to do is start praying. 
you know, have an icon before you, but don't have any imagination. You just have to start praying and, and uh, seeking God with your heart and, you know, doing it slowly. You know, some will recommend breathing in the Lord Jesus Christ, breathing out, have mercy on me, a sinner. But that would be the extent of it. Um, so I think that would also be, you know, these teachers would be saying, no, don't go down that road. So I think they'd be agreeing with you that that's the possibility of delusion there. You wouldn't want to do that. And of course, you always want to do anything like this under the direction of your spiritual father. Because, you know, we should, none of us should be lone rangers. We should all have someone we can go to to help us say, you know, what's, what about this? I'm having this question or this is happening in my prayers. You know, what can I do with that? And, and they have the spiritual authority to say, this is going on. Or if, you know, father or your spiritual father didn't know them, he would appeal to some, you know, a bishop, for example. The second one, though, I think is, what is this experience? And we would say, you've become holy, so you're, you're now, there's nothing stopping you from sensing and seeing God anymore in your heart. You know, it's very different from seeking a, a spiritual experience, which you can easily be fooled in, you know. And, and this is not nothingness. It's, it's a person. You don't understand him. You can't, you know, you can't grasp his nature, but you can be in his presence, and he can reveal himself to you. And that's what, the, that's what this hesychastic experience is all about. It's about being with a person as a person. You yourself as a, as a person... God is a person. You're two people coming together. You're overwhelmed, but you're still you, and he's he, you know. And that's very different from the kind of stuff you read about, you know, where people get into trances or whatever and, and uh, seeking nothingness, um, enlightenment. Yeah, I like that you said that it's, I'm not looking for an experience, a spiritual experience. That, that's you yeah. Know, yeah, we and probably a way of, of expressing this idea of hesychism yeah. and you know, in an image like this is saying that it's something that is possible within our spiritual life, <clears throat> but it, but it's not um, it's not like we say, oh, I want that and set out for that. Um, the, I guess this goes with, with a more general idea about spiritual life in our church. This is a distinct thing. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a Catholic teaching, but I think it, I think it is something that, that happens within Catholicism, uh, especially with respect to something like monasticism. They'll say, well, monastics and priests have a different spirituality, and they do different things than the lay people. And what we see in the Orthodox Church is it's the same spirituality, but in terms of who we are and where we are, that kind of determines to the extent and depth that we get involved with that. So we could say that this is possible for all of us, but the likelihood that um, you know, if a, you know, a monk in some monastery in the U.S., a parish priest, or someone just sitting in a pew having this experience, it's it's highly unlikely. Mm-hmm. But the things that uh, those few who do have this experience do are the same sorts of things that we would do. And the earlier slide, you know, Randy showing the, the Jesus prayer. I mean, that, that's part of the discussion about hesychism, and there's, there's a discussion of that and the use of the Jesus prayer. But we all um, are commanded to do that prayer. It may not necessarily end up there, but it's still something that we um, grow into and, and leads to depth in our spiritual life. And he's done so many that he broke his <laughs> True. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. The topic is a mystical theology, mysticism in orthodoxy. So all the way out to June? Yeah, it's in June. I can't remember the exact date, though. Nine? Seven, eight? Midnight? No. No. Oh. Yeah.
I'm glad you brought it up, yeah. yeah. The flyer's wrong. Yeah. All right.